Well, friends, let us unite together in the public worship of God. And we do so as we sing in the words of Psalm 40 from the beginning. Psalm 40 from the beginning. These verses of testimony, of waiting on the Lord and trusting in him and the response of grace that he brings. Stephen, if you would sing. I waited for the Lord my God and patiently did bear. At length to me he did incline my voice and cry to hear. He took me from a fearful pit and from the miry clay. And on a rock he set my feet, establishing my way. He put a new song in my mouth, O God, to magnify. Many shall see it, and shall fear, and on the Lord rely. O oh, blessed is the man whose trust upon the Lord relies, respecting not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. O oh, Lord my God, full many are the wonders thou hast done. Thy gracious thoughts to us were far above all thoughts are gone. In order, none can reckon them to thee. If them declare and speak of them, I would. They more than can be numbered are. One through five, I waited for the Lord my God. I
before the Lord in prayer. We must acknowledge, O oh Lord, that God's gracious thoughts to us too are gone beyond our numbering. As we review today itself, the multitude of ways in which we have experienced the Lord's kindness, as we review the week in which we have just passed through, we see many, many examples of God's graciousness toward us. We have been preserved in many ways, provided for in many ways. Some of us in traveling away from home and brought back safely. Others in ill health who have known a measure of improvement. And others perhaps having not known a measure of improvement, but having been able to make their way through another week in the midst of difficulties and uh, hard circumstances. We have received our daily bread. And for all of these things, we are bound to give thanks. Giving thanks for the gracious kindness of God toward us as a community and even as a nation. We enjoy many rich things that others do not. Help us, eternal Lord, then to come with thanksgiving to offer to the Lord our God what is his due and save us from coldness in our hearts, from grumbling spirits, from thankless spirits that take every blessing that comes but has no thought of where it might have come from. And help us to see, eternal Lord, that even if this week has brought difficulties into our lives, that even in the Lord's hand, these things too can become blessings. If they become a means of drawing us to the Lord, a means of strengthening us in the Lord, a means of showing us the uncertainty of our lives and the need for something real and tangible and beyond the mere things of this world. And in that way, even hard things can become blessings in disguise. Help us, eternal Lord, to improve on these things and to hear in all of our providences the voice of God speaking to us, encouraging the Lord's people and keeping them, preserving them on in the right path, Throwing them back if they have wandered, warming them if they have grown cold, warning them if they have gone astray. And that others too would hear this voice and discern God's voice in their own circumstances and realize this is the voice of God, that they would question what the Lord is saying to them and that uh, having received an answer, they would be inclined to obey him and to follow him and to go in his way. For how often, Lord, we receive an answer. How often, Lord, we receive guidance. And it is not according to our will. And we reject it and we rebuff it and we push it to one side. Our eternal Lord, we pray that that would not be our reaction today but that we would be like young Samuel. Speak, Lord, for my heart is open to hear what it will say. That we would be like David, turning his feet into the way of God, whatever nay, that way might be, knowing that the Lord's way is the best way, the safest way, and the only way indeed. A blessing eternal Lord upon us then as we gather. May the Holy Spirit Come and warm our worship. May our hearts be turned heavenward. They are focused on the ground and on the earth. They are focused on the things of this world. Day and night we are focused on them. Help us eternal Lord to leave them aside for a little. And on this market day of the soul. 
to come and buy the things of the gospel and to buy them freely for they are without money and without price. We pray thy blessing, Lord, then upon each one of us, the families we belong to, the burdens we carry, the joys we share, the fears we harbor. We leave them eternal, Lord, one and all, in thy care. Remember eternal one, any who are unwell. And we know that there are such in our own midst. <laughs> Commit them, Lord, again to the hand and to the grace of God. We pray that they might know help in the midst of difficulty and blessing in the midst of hard things. Remember, Lord, the, the wider community. We pray for it and we pray for those even who have known bereavement in the past days within our midst uh, as a community. We pray, Lord, for the wider work of the gospel, the congregations of our presbytery, the presbyteries of our denomination at home and in other parts of the world as well. We pray for the work of the gospel amongst the, the ancient people of God. They can trace themselves back to Abraham. But there is no word of Christ in that tracing, in that tree, in that family tree. And he must be there for he is the root of it all. Grant, Lord, that they would come to see that he is the tree and that without Christ at the very center of it, kinship to Abraham and anybody else is utterly futile. For Abraham cannot save them or us. Only the one who is called Jesus can save his people from their sins. Bless then the work amongst them and hasten the day when the promises we find in the word are fulfilled. In front of our very eyes, what a blessing that would be, what a, a joy that would be for us, how our hearts would overflow with thankfulness. Revive, Lord, thy work and kingdom in our own nation and across the Western world. The decline is obvious and stark and alarming, yet the Lord's hand is not shortened. Bring us, Lord, in humility, in penitence, in true genuine seeking of God so that we will see a work of God and a work of grace in our own day and in our own land. We pray for those who govern us, the queen, the royal household, our prime minister, our first minister, our local representatives, those who make decisions and on whom the burdens of state fall. We pray, Lord, for direction and godly direction. We pray that the word of God and the direction of that word would be given its place. It is not given its place. We have gone our own way and we freely acknowledge it. And we are going further and further in the wrong way. Even while the nation is thinking it's going further and further in the right way. What blindness has fallen us. What hardness of heart. We confess, O oh Lord, these things. And we confess that all too often the church has been silent when it should have been spoken, when it should have spoken, that it has been cold and half-hearted when it should have been zealous and warm-hearted. We confess, eternal Lord, that we have been plagued by yeah, a, a, a gazing inward at times when our heart should have been going outward. We confess our coldness in evangelism. We confess our lack of concern for our fellow men and women and boys and girls who are around us in our homes, in our families, in our communities, and in this nation and across the nations of the world. We lack so much of the spirit of Christ. We lack so much of the zeal of the master who spent and was spent and who valued so greatly uh, the value of each soul. Forgive us, Lord, for how lightly we take these things, for how lightly we take our own spiritual concerns, for how cold we are, for how prayerless we are at times, for how formulaic we are in our prayers, for our, uh, our coldness toward the word of God and towards the worship of God, towards the day of God and towards the people of God. Oh Lord, forgive us our sin and cleanse us and warm us and sanctify us by the power of God's spirit. And do so even today as we gather. Hear our prayers as we pray for those that we have already mentioned, and for ourselves, 
for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, we turn now to read in God's Word. In First Samuel. <clears throat> Samuel in chapter 13. Well, we're actually going to read in the end of chapter 29 just to preserve the context. But <clears throat> we'll read from verse 7 of chapter 29. coming, as you can see, towards the end of our studies in this part of God's Word and the events that we've been following for the past few weeks are about to reach their dramatic climax. Now, we're going to read that in chapter 7, the, the uh, chapter 20, 29, rather, from verse 7, in that part of God's Word we were considering last Lord's Day. And you remember the background there in David is amongst the Philistines, foolishly, and he finds himself in a bit of a corner. They go out to fight Israel, and he has to play along. But the generals of the Philistines don't trust him. Verse 7, and here's Achish, the king of the Philistines, breaking the news, as it were, to David. Wherefore now return and go in peace. This please not the lords of the Philistines. And David said to Achish, but what have I done? What hast thou found in thy servant so long as I have been with thee to this day, that I may not go fight against the enemies of my lord, the king? And Achish answered and said to David, I know that thou art good in my sight as an angel of God. I think I commented last week in our reading that if Achish had realized the deception that David was engaged in, he would have described him as anything but an angel of God. Notwithstanding, the princes of the Philistines have said, he shall not go up with us to the battle. Wherefore now rise up early in the morning with thy master's servants that are come with thee. And as soon as you be up early in the morning and of light, depart. So David and his men rose up early to depart in the morning, to return into the land of the Philistines. And the Philistines went up to Jezreel. And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziglag. Now you remember Ziglag was a city in which they were staying for the last uh, year or two. When they were come to Ziglag on the third day, that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziglag and smitten Ziglag and burned it with fire. And had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city and behold, it was burned with fire and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captive. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captive Ahinoman, the Jezreelites, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. Now, again, as I've commented before, it just records here as a simple fact that David had more than one wife. It's not commending him for that. Of course, it's not, but it's simply recording it. So sometimes people will say, well, you know, surely polygamy or whatever you might call it, um, it is fine. I mean, David had more than one wife. Well, yes, he did, but. He did that in defiance of God's uh, way. Verse um, 6. And David was greatly distressed, for the, Lord, for the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his, for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. Now the ephod was part of the uniform of the priesthood 
and it included the mysterious Urim and Thummim, which was used to discern God's will in the Old Testament period. I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought hither the ephod to David. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. So David went, he and the six hundred men that were with him, and came to the brook Bezor, where those that were left behind stayed. But David pursued, he and four hundred men, for two hundred abode behind, which were so faint that they could not go over the brook Bezor. They were probably tired because they had gone out with the Philistines, and then they had marched back for several days, and then the shock of discovering the city in ashes would have had its own effect on them. So 200 of them are, they don't go on and they stay behind and they'll feature later on in the chapter. And they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David and gave him bread and he did eat and they gave him drink and they made him drink water and they gave him a cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit came again to him, for he had eaten no bread nor drunk any water three days and three nights. And David said to him, Whom belongest thou? Whence art thou? And he said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite. Now, he was probably a slave, let's say servant, but slave is more likely. I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite. And my master left me because three days ago I fell sick. We made an invasion upon the south of the Kerathites and on the coast which belongs to Judah and upon the south of Caleb. And we burned Ziglag with fire. In other words, David has stumbled across somebody who belonged to the group which were responsible for what had happened at Ziglag. And David said to him, can so bring me down to this company? In other words, can you show me where the Amalekites are? And he said, swear to me by God that thou wilt neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will bring thee down to this company. And when he had brought him down, behold, they were spread abroad upon all the earth, that's the Amalekites, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and out of the land of Judah. And David smote them from the twilight, even to the evening of the next day. And there escaped not a man of them, save 400 young men, which rode upon camels and fled. And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. And David rescued his two wives. And there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil nor anything that they had taken to them. David recovered all. And David took all the flocks and the herds which they drove before those other cattle and said, this is David's spoil. And David came to the 200 men which were so faint that they could not follow David whom they had made to abide at the brook Bezor. And they went forth to meet David and to meet the people that were with him. And when David came near to the people, he saluted them. Now, salute there means it's a warm. It's, it's not just a cold military thing. It's, it's a warm. He was, he, he was pleased to see them again. Then answered all the wicked men and men of Belial of those that went with David and said, because they went not with us, we will not give them aught of the spoil we have recovered, save to every man his wife and his children, that they may lead them away and depart. Then said David, you shall not do so, my brethren, with that which the Lord hath given us, who hath preserved us and delivered the company that came against us into our hand. But who will hearken to you in this matter? But as his part is, that goes down to the battle, so shall be his part that tarrieth by the stuff. They shall be part alike. And it was so from that day forward 
that he made it a statute and an ordinance for Israel unto this day. In other words, they, he, he says, no, he said, everybody's going to get a fair share here, whether they were with us on the front line or whether they were involved in other things. Uh, nobody is going to be left without. Verse 26, and when David came to Ziglag, he sent of the spoil to the elders of Judah, even to his friends, saying, Behold, a present for you of the spoil of the enemies of the Lord, to them which were in Bethel, and to them which were in South Ramah, and to them which were in Jatir, and to them which were in Aroa, and to them which were in Shiphmah, and to them which were in Ethchemah, and to them which were in Rachal, and to them which were in the cities of the Jeremites, and to them which were in the cities of the Kenites, and to them which were in Horma, and to them which were in Chorachthan, and to them which were in Atha, and to them that were in Hebron, and to all the places where David himself and his men were wont to haunt. In other words, he didn't forget his friends who had helped him in his hard days. He gave them a share of what he had recovered from the Amalekites. And we trust the Lord to follow with his own blessing that reading of his word. We turn and we sing in Psalm 31 and at 19, Psalm 31 and at 19. How great the goodness thou for them that fear thee keepst in store, and wroughtst for them that trust in thee, sons of men before. In secret of thy presence thou shalt hide them from man's pride. In strife of tongues thou closely shalt us in a tent them hide all praise and thanks be to the Lord, for he hath magnified his wondrous love to me within a city fortified down to verse 24. Be of good courage, and he strength unto your heart shall send. All ye use hope and confidence from the Lord. Repent. How great is the goodness. <clears throat> I
But friend, seeking the light of God's spirit, we turn again now to the first book of Samuel in chapter 30. And we'll read just now at verse 6. We'll take that as our connecting link. Verse 6. <clears throat> 1 Samuel chapter 30, reading at verse 6. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Well, you remember last Lord's Day, the background to this passage, indeed we touched on it our reading just now. David had foolishly allied himself with the Philistines, thinking that was a good move. It turned out to be a disastrous move, of course, because he finds himself eventually in a bit of a tight corner. The Philistines go out to battle against Israel, and he is expected to take part in that on the Philistine side. But the Lord in his mercy takes him out of his own, the trap that he had set for himself by causing the Philistine generals to distrust David. They said to King Achish of the Philistines, there is no way we're going to go to battle with David as part of our ranks. Achish, if ever there was a Trojan horse, this is it. They insist that um, Achish uh, makes David turn back home to Ziglag, and that is what uh, happens, of course. Now, little did David know when he was sent back home how important it was that he was sent back home that very day. Because we're going to see in this passage God's timing and how right it always is. It's never too early. And it's never too late. Now, hold on to that thought because I'm going to come back to it in a minute. It's never too early and it's never too late. During David's absence, the Amalekites, with whom he had been engaged in conflict anyway, they take advantage of David being away from home. They attacked the city of Ziglag mercifully. They didn't kill the people, but they did take them away as prisoners. And that included David's family. Now, what a shock awaited them as they returned back to Ziglag. The city that they had left behind is now reduced to a smoking ruin. And as somebody has put it, the outcome of his compromise is lying in ashes around him. The outcome of all his compromise is lying in ashes around him. Now, I said about two minutes ago that God is never too late. And you might be thinking, well, wasn't he too late here? Isn't the timing all wrong? Wouldn't it have been better if a David had been sent home a couple of days earlier? That way, he would have been there when the Amalekites came. He would have been able to rebuff the attack and everything would have worked out better, surely. No, it wasn't. Because, you see, the Lord had an important lesson to teach David. He's going to help David, as we'll see in a moment. But at exact, at the same time, David, David is going to have to taste, he's going to have to taste the bitterness of his folly. He's going to have to taste the bitterness of his folly. Why? So that he wouldn't go down the road of compromise and lies and deceit so quickly again. He's going to be taught a lesson. And because the Lord is going to teach him a lesson, he allows the Amalekites to come. 
They're not delayed. They come. They're allowed to plunder the city while David is away. He arrives back. Humanly speaking, we would say he's too late. But in God's calendar, as we'll see in a moment, he's not too late at all. Now, naturally, David and his companions are distraught. We read in verse 4 that they, they wept until they could weep no more. But then they move on to the next stage in their anguish, and their sorrow turns to anger. And they begin to point the finger at David in verse 6. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his son and for his daughters. Why did you take us away to fight the Philistines, David? This is your fault. Why did you leave the city defenseless, David? This is your fault. Why did you provoke the Amalek Amalekites in chapter 27? They came here because you provoked them, David. This is all your fault. And the crowd begins to turn ugly and angry. And there's talk even of stoning David to death. Do you ever feel that things can't get worse? And then they do. Maybe that's how it is for yourself today. Maybe in the midst of a sea of problems, things have got worse. Maybe even this very week itself, things have got worse. Well, that's how it was for David. It seems things couldn't get worse. He's in a problem with the Philistines that it's hard to get out of. He's sent home to discover the city is burnt to the ground and the people are all gone. And then just as it couldn't get worse, it does. The people turn and threaten his life. What does David do? Verse six again. But David, the last two lines there, encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Now, for the last few weeks, we've watched as David has gone further and further away from the Lord, further and further away from the right place in the wrong direction. Maybe that's the way you are yourself. You're wandering away. In the wrong direction. Maybe it's at a snail's pace. Maybe it's quite a fast pace. But like David. You've wandered from the Lord. From the things of God. And you're not in a good place. Well David at this point. Was not in a good place. But here in verse 6. Is a turning point in David's life. He's at rock bottom. And maybe, my friend, you feel at rock bottom as well. Well, here's David, and he's at rock bottom. And it becomes a turning point in his life. And the dark storm clouds actually break, and sunshine begins to shine through. Because David, the backsliding believer, is returning to the Lord. And he's encouraging himself in the Lord, his God. Now, what does that phrase mean? What's David doing when he's encouraging himself in the Lord, his God? Well, can I suggest from the passage that there are four things he's doing? And children, this is for the first of the four points on, you, on your little sheet. There are four things that he's doing. First of all, he's remembering God's promises. He's remembering God's promises. All the promises that the Lord had given him, and we've seen them chapter after chapter, all the way back through 1 Samuel. All the encouragements that the Lord had given him, all the signs that he had given him, that he would keep his promises to David. 
And David recalls them here. And he finds fresh encouragement as he begins to remember again God's dealings with him. But he can't do it without a red face. He's blushing as he remembers that alongside God's promises, that was his own failure to remember these promises, to apply these promises, to live in the light of these promises. He's remembering with sorrow the events of the last chapters, going to the Philistines, falling into unbelief, lying and being involved in all sorts of deception and all sorts of wrong things. And he's repenting of that bitterly. He's not just weeping because the city's burned down and his house is gone. David is weeping because he's been a fool. He's confessing to the Lord, what a fool I have been. I've forgotten God's way. I've forsaken God and his word. I set out on my own. I tried to manage as I best I could. I've told lies. I've been deceptive. I had no word of the Lord. He wasn't in all my thoughts in all these weeks and months. And this is how it's ended. Look where it's brought me to. But no doubt David also remembered that God promises to receive and to revive and to restore those who turn back to him. You remember the way it's put in in 1 John chapter 1. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And David is discovering that. He's discovering the Lord is ready to forgive ready to receive him, ready to restore him, ready to clean up the wounds that he's given himself. He's coming back to the Lord, creeping back, and he's discovering that the Lord was the same as he had always been. And there in the midst of the smoking ruins, he's encouraging himself in the Lord. As he confesses his folly. And as he puts his hand again. Into the greater hand of his heavenly father. Oh it's good to remember God's promises. It's good to take a moment this Lord's day morning. To remember what he says. Because no doubt for the last six days, your mind has been filled with the things of life and the promises you made to others and they made to you and all the things you had to do. We put them to one side for a minute. We think of God's word, God's promise to those who seek him, to those who trust him. It seemed to be an ordinary day on the 15th of October, 1864, in the Free Church Manse in Finiston in Glasgow. The Reverend Andrew Bonner, the minister of the Finiston Free Church congregation, was in his study. He was reading in Nahum chapter 1, and his eye fell on verse 7. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows them that trust in him. The words struck him. He was mulling them over in his mind. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows them that trust in him. Little did he know as he wrote himself. Little did I know that half an hour later, my wife Isabella would die suddenly. And that he would need that text for the days and for the hours and the months that lay ahead. It was a promise 
of God, an affirmation of God's character that kept Andrew Bonar on his feet as he found himself suddenly left with a young family bereft of their mother. He's remembering God's promises. But one word of caution before I leave this. It says here that David encouraged himself in the Lord. Encouraging yourself in the Lord is not, can I repeat that, not turning to the Lord when trouble comes and then forgetting all about him when the trouble is past. There's always a danger that we do that, that we treat the Lord in heaven as a sort of lucky charm and we run to him when there's trouble. And then when the trouble's gone, we, we shrug him off and we forget about him. That is not what David is doing here. That is not what encouraging ourselves in the Lord is about, but that happens all too often. No, you notice what it says in verse 6. The second last word in the verse. David encouraged himself in the Lord. His God. His God. There's a vital living link between David and the Lord here. He's not just God. Vague and far off. He's his God. His Lord. His king, his savior, his stronghold in the day of trouble, his everything. We only encourage ourselves in the Lord, we, really, when he becomes our God. And when we become his people. And when we become united to him by a living faith. Worked in our hearts by none other than the Holy Spirit. At that moment, amidst the ruins, amidst the ruins, David couldn't say my home. It was burnt to the ground. He couldn't even say my family. He had no idea if they were dead or alive. But he could say, my God. It's the one thing he could say. The one thing that was steadfast. This is God. I don't know if you can say that today. Maybe there are other things that aren't as sure as they were. Can you say my God is? God is my refuge and my strength. In straits of present day. Therefore, although the earth remove, although the Amalekites burn the place to the ground, although they take away my family as prisoners, although all of that happens, we will not be afraid. David is doing four things. He's remembering God's promises. But secondly, he's entering God's presence. Verses 7 and 8. And David said to Abiathar, bring me hither the ephod. Now this was a way of discerning God's will. I spoke about it in the reading. Now, there was no hint in the previous chapters that David had been entering God's presence, that he had been praying to God, that he had sought God's leading. All the evidence is in the opposite direction that he hadn't been going to the Lord. He'd been bypassing the Lord, and maybe that's the way you are yourself, bypassing the Lord. Trying to get on with life, but bypassing the Lord. You know the way a, a road bypasses a town sometimes. There'll be a town and you had to drive through it once. And then they build a bypass. And you can drive all the way around it much faster. Well, there's times I got in life. We drive on a bypass. And it seems faster. Seems easier. Well, David is now coming to the Lord. He's coming back to the Lord. And he's doing that through Abiathar. Now, God had provided David with a priest. He had provided him with this man, Abiathar. And now, through Abiathar, he's coming. He's confessing his sin. He's seeking God's forgiveness for the past and God's guidance for the future. Verse 8, 
David inquired of the Lord, will I pursue after them? Will I overtake them? He's remembering God's promises, and we have to do that. That's the first step in encouraging ourselves in the Lord. It's not enough to remember God's promises. We have to enter God's presence. We have to come to him. We have to come to him by ourselves, individually. Ah, you say, I don't have a priest I can come by. I don't have an Abiathar. Oh, friend, you do. You have the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the priest that God has provided for us. Hebrews 4. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14. It speaks of coming to God through Christ. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us come boldly, verse 16, to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let's come boldly, because we have a priest. God has provided one. We come to God and we come to him through Christ, through the Father, through the Son. David's encouraging self in the Lord. He's remembering God's promises. Let's take a minute to do it. He's entering God's presence. Be sure you do it. Don't stay outside. Don't bypass him today. Don't linger at a distance. You enter his presence. You come to him. As you are, where you are. How you are. Oh, you say he won't receive me. Oh, friend, he will. He is far more ready to receive you than you are to come. That's the truth of the matter. He's, he's remembering God's promises. He's entering God's presence. Thirdly, he's trusting God's providence. God's providence is God's power and way of working things out. And David is trusting that to the Lord. He said, will I pursue him? Will I overtake the Amalekites? And the Lord says, yes, off you go. You'll recover everything. What a sweet promise that was. You know, you've got to admire the Lord's kindness here, don't you? He says to David, you'll recover everything. And so David thrusts himself to the Lord. For months and months and months, he had failed to do this. And it's ended up in disaster. Now he says, I trust the Lord. And if you're going to encourage yourself in the Lord, you're going to have to remember his word. You're going to have to enter his presence. And you're going to have to trust his providence. You're going to have to leave yourself in his hands and bring yourself into his hands. Commits himself to the Lord who had never failed him. Though he had often failed the Lord. And isn't that true for yourself too? You've often failed him. Has he failed you? Oh, not a bit of it. Not a bit of it. David is now ready. To obey God's word and trust God's hand. And that's always the best evidence of having really come to the Lord. If we're trusting him and following him. Now perhaps David's natural inclination would be to rush off. What would you have done if you'd arrived in Ziklag and the place had been burnt with fire and you realized the Amalekites had taken everybody prisoner? I know what I'd be tempted to do. To rush off straight away. Not a minute to lose. In case they get further away. But he doesn't. David stops. David stops. He puts it into the Lord's hand. He seeks God's guidance. He seeks God's blessing. I think it's A.W. Pink who puts it like this. The progress might not be so swift, but it will be more sure. And he's right. If 
Or I take a step up to the Amalekites. Let's seek God's guidance. Before you take a step any further, seek God's guidance, seek God's hand, seek God's grace. What does Isaiah say? You know the verse. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not fit. And they'll catch the Amalekites. They'll catch the Amalekites. Because God has told him he's going to catch the Amalekites. And you see how he does it. Verse 11. Do you see what happens to those who trust in God's providence? Verse 11. And they found an Egyptian in the field. Now David and his men had no idea. Which direction the Amalekites had gone in. And no idea how far ahead they were. It was a needle in a haystack. How is he going to find them? David might go east. They might have gone northwest. They might have doubled back. Suddenly the Lord provides the answer. They come across a man. Who's sick and hungry in a field. He turns out to be an Egyptian slave. Who had been with the Amalekites. But when he became sick. They left him behind. Presumably to die. Verse 13. I am a young man of Egypt. Servant to Amalekite. And my master left me. Because three days ago I fell sick. Do you see God's providence here? This slave had to become sick. This slave had to be abandoned by his master. This slave had to be lying there ill in the very spot that David and his people were passing through. They found an Egyptian. Oh, they certainly did. God led them directly to the Egyptian. Little did the Amalekite master think when he abandoned his slave three days before that it would prove his undoing. They found an Egyptian. They give him food. They give him a promise that they will save his life. And in return, he says, oh, I know where the Amalekites are. I can take you straight to them. I know their plans. It's just a tiny little providence. But little providences, says D.R. Davis, make big differences. Little providences make big differences. He's remembering God's word promises. He's entering God's presence. He's trusting God's providence. Finally, he's singing God's praise. The Amalekites are totally unprepared for David's arrival. And he can take swift advantage of that. He delivers his family. He, he delivers justice to the Amalekites. I'm not going to go into that anymore just now. My time is gone. But What a blessing it was for that slave that he was on David's side in that moment. David becomes his protector. If he'd been on the side of the Amalekites, he would have... Shared in their destruction. Our friends, you must be on the side of the Lord before the sword of divine justice falls. So they're able to recover it all. And they head back home. And they meet the 200 who were too tired to go all the way with them. And some of David's men have become greedy. And they're looking at the things they have. And they're saying there's not enough for everybody. The 200 who didn't go with us, they'll get their family back. But none of this, none of the rest, none of the spoils and the booty and the loot. It's ours, they say. The spoil, verse 22, that we recovered. David puts them right in verse 23. You didn't recover anything, he says. 
You wouldn't even have found the Amalekites if the Lord hadn't shown you where they were. You wouldn't have defeated them if the Lord hadn't given you the power to do it. It's God who gave it to us. The praise is God's. Oh, Christian, you have no room for pride. What I've done and what I've achieved. Friends, we've achieved nothing. Truth be told. It's God who gives it. And the praise is his. It all hinges on what God has given. And to us a child is born. And to us a son is given. Everything hinges on God's giving. And without that Christian friend. What do you have? So there's no need for any of us to. Make ourselves big. We have to do what David does and sing God's praise. We're going to sing in a moment in Psalm 119. Ere I afflicted was I strayed, but now I keep thy word. I often think of this incident in David's life when I read that verse. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. That's exactly what he did. But he said, now I keep God's word. His afflictions have brought him spiritual blessing. And oh, friend, I hope it's the same for yourself. Can I quote Alan Redpath? Do you really desire that God may bring you into victory and blessing today? Then the moment you stand with a broken heart, Amid the ruins of your self-life, acknowledging the folly of fighting against God. When you turn your eyes to Jesus, when you lift your tear-stained face to your wonderful Lord, at that moment, he not only lifts you up, but brings you victory and sends you out in its pursuit. The beginning of the chapter. David is standing amongst the burnt ruins of his self-will. But by the end of the chapter, what does it say in verse 19? David recovered all. And that sends us to Jesus, does it not? Because Jesus finds us. In the burnt ruins of our self-will. With nothing left. But he recovers all for his people. And more than the all they lost. He is our David. Who recovers all for us. And who puts in our hand. What we lost through our own folly. What a king. What a savior. Let's encourage ourselves. In him. May God bless his word. Let us pray. We give thanks eternal Lord for. Our David. The David of the New Testament who never failed and who leads captivity captive and who receives gifts for poor sinners and puts them in their hand. And as we see ourselves today like David here, help us to do what he did, to remember God's promises, to enter God's presence, uh, to uh, sing God's praise. To help us, eternal Lord, to trust God's providence. Bless thy word to us. And forgive us our sins, especially in holy things, for Jesus' sake.
Amen. Well, we're going to sing these verses I mentioned. Psalm 119, and we'll sing from 20, from 61 rather, 61 down to 68. You notice verse 67, Ere I afflicted was, I strayed, so now I keep thy word. Verse 61, bands of ill men me robbed. Well, that's what happened to David. He was robbed, but uh, he turned to the Lord. From 61 to 68, bands of ill men me robbed. Bands of ill men me robbed. of God the Holy Spirit rest on and abide with you all now and forever. Amen.